Hi, I'm Meredith Gardner from the Autonomy Region Conservation Authority. Today, we are going to learn about citizen science and how you can be a citizen scientist. We're going to talk about the Autonomy Region Watershed. You're going to learn a little bit about how we monitor water quality and other indicators, and then we're going to teach you how to do it. This supports Landmark 22, the Pathway to Stewardship, and it's all about citizen science. I like to think of citizen science and monitoring as being a watershed detective. So first of all, let's learn a little bit about the Autonomy Region Watershed. The Autonomy Region Watershed is just under 2,000 square kilometers in size, so it's quite big, and it includes the watersheds of three major rivers, the Autonomy River, the Indian River, and the Ouse River. Watersheds are kind of like bathtubs. So if you think of a bathtub, the height of land in a watershed is like the edges of that tub. So if you pulled all the curtains back, turned on the shower, the water's gonna hit the edge of the bathtub and it's either gonna go into the tub and down the drain or it's gonna go out onto the bathroom floor. And watersheds are just like that. So that height of land, the highest point, is what divides all of the watersheds. So all of our work is in the Autonomy Region watershed and we're one of 36 conservation authorities across the province. We do a number of different things. We help protect people from flooding. We help people find good places to build their houses. We own 10,000 acres of land. We monitor the health of our watershed and we help protect the sources of our drinking water. So we do a lot of different things. But today we're gonna to focus on that citizen science and that monitoring component. Paul Finnegan, our watershed biologist, is going to tell you now about how we monitor and what the equipment is that we use. Over to you, Paul. So now that we know what a watershed is, why is it important? There's a lot of reasons why watersheds are important, one of which is biodiversity. Watersheds provide a lot of habitat, aquatic habitat such as uh, streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, or terrestrial habitat like large forest plots. Ultimately, a lot of wildlife call watersheds their home. So watersheds are important. Watersheds also help prevent floods and the severity of floods. Wetlands retain a lot of water after an extreme severe rain event when all our snow melts. So when there is a flood, a lot of that water that may damage our property or flood our basements would end up these wetlands instead. So a watershed that has a lot of wetlands can prevent how floods can affect us. Riparian zones are also important for the impacts of floods. Riparian zones are areas right next to a creek or a stream or a lake. And these areas, when they're vegetated with a lot of shrubs and trees, can prevent uh, erosion, so uh, damage to the ground and loss of property. Uh, watersheds are really important to help prevent the damage that floods can uh, present a community. Watersheds can help us have cleaner water. Wetlands filter water, riparian zones protect water from pollution, and some people get their water from groundwater, from wells. And uh, healthy forests mean cleaner groundwater. Watersheds are also a lot of fun. There's a lot of recreational opportunities like boating, kayaking, canoeing, swimming, fishing, and the list goes on. Ultimately, a healthy watershed translates to not just a healthier environment, but also promotes uh, better human health as well. So, water. We swim in it. We drink it. Fish breathe in it. Ducks float on it. How do we monitor water? And how do we use water to assess how good our watershed is? Well, part of my job is to assess how well our watershed is doing. So, think of this. How does your teacher assess how well you're doing in school? You get a report card and you get grades. Part of my job is to grade the watershed. And one of the things I test the watershed on is water quality. So I produce one of these watershed report cards. And just like your report cards, inside this report card, it gets grades. A's, B's, C's. And one of those grades is for surface water or water quality. So how do I get to those grades? How do I test water quality? I have a lot of really cool tools that I want to show you and uh, share with you. One of those is a, uh, a temperature logger. 
this little unit here, I can put in the water, whether it be a stream or a wetland or a lake, and every 30 seconds, it's gonna record the temperature of that water. It can do it for weeks, months, or even years. And then I can just download it on my computer and get all that data on water temperature. Another tool that I use is uh, I just simply collect water and send it to someone else. So I might uh, use one of these bottles, fill it up with water, and I'll send it to a special laboratory where they'll test if there's any metals in it or pollutants, anything that I want to know about that water, I can get a laboratory to test that out for me. I also have this uh, water quality probe. So this thing right here, there's these sensors and each one of these sensors tests something different in the water. Could be the amount of salt, could be uh, water temperature, uh, dissolved oxygen, so the amount of oxygen in the water, Things like fish that have gills, they breathe oxygen just like you do, but in the water. So we can measure how much oxygen those fish have. This also measures uh, pH. pH is a measurement of uh, how alkaline or how acidic water is. And certain organisms like fish need a, uh, a certain pH to be able to live in for them to be happy. Take a look at this chart. When you're looking at this chart, you'll see that uh, fish need a certain pH to live, and that range in pH is fairly narrow. So pH is really important, and it's something that we measure to help to assess water quality in our watershed. Another important parameter that we talked about a little bit already is water temperature. If you want to take a look at this chart, you'll notice that certain fish like certain temperatures of water. There's fish that like warm water, like largemouth bass, and fish that like really cold water, like our trout and salmon. I'm gonna send you over to Meredith. She's gonna explain how you can test water quality near you without all these fancy tools. Hi everyone. Now that you've learned a little bit about how we monitor water quality and autonomy conservation with all the equipment Paul just showed you, I'm gonna show you a couple of really simple ways that you can monitor water quality at home, in your classroom, using uh, some really simple tools. So we're going to use some pH test strips that you use in pools and hot tubs, and we're going to use a pool thermometer. Uh, both of these things you can buy at any pool supply store, any hardware store. If you've got a pool or a hot tub at home, you've probably seen both of these uh, around. So first of all, we're going to look at pH. So you learned a bit about pH with Paul, uh, and you've got your pH scale with acidic at one end, alkaline at the other, and neutral in the middle. And that neutral area in the middle is what is perfect for aquatic life. So streams and creeks and rivers in the Autonomy Region watershed generally have a pH level between 6.5 and 8.5. That's perfect. That's just what most species need to live. So we're going to take a look at what the pH is in my two buckets here. This bucket is tap water. This bucket is from Jackson Creek. So you can compare different buckets, uh, different types of water if you want to, or, or you can just test one. If you are collecting water from a local water course, make sure that you do it safely. Uh, don't go down to a creek or stream bank in the spring when it might be slippery and the water's really cold and dangerous. Uh, make sure you've got an adult with you uh, or your teacher. So just make sure that, uh, that you're safe when you're doing any of these things. We're gonna take our test strip. We're gonna stick it in the water. Just do a quick dip. Then we have to let it sit for 15 seconds. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare it to the scale. The scale comes on the bottle, and I've uh, blown it up for you. We're looking at the orange square, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to match it up and see where does it fall in the scale. So it looks like we're kind of between these two. So that's between 7.2 and 7.8. So that's perfect. Uh, as I said, the pH in streams and creeks and rivers in our watershed is usually between 6.5 and 8.5, so that's right within the range where aquatic species would be quite happy. So that's perfect. That's the first part of our citizen science. Now we're going to look at temperature. So as you learned with Paul, temperature affects the types of species that like to live in water. So some species like warm water, some species like cold water. So when you're measuring your temperature, you're just going to stick your thermometer in. Uh, if you are near a creek or stream, uh, you can put this right in the water. You're going to want a longer string on it. And again, you're going to want to be careful because you're near the water, so make sure you're not doing that by yourself. And you're going to take a look at the temperature. 
So if you are at a stream where it's really shaded um, and it might be really cold, the water might be really cold, even on a hot day, you're going to stick your hand in, it's going to be freezing. You could be in an area where there's groundwater upwellings, so that water's coming from underground aquifers. Certain species love that kind of water. Trout are going to love that. Cold water can hold more dissolved oxygen than warm water, so you're going to find trout species in there, uh, and it's often very good quality as well. So it's, looking at temperature is like being a detective. You're going to start to understand more about your stream when you know what the temperature is. If you are putting your thermometer in, say, Shimon Lake. Shimon Lake is a warm water lake because it's really shallow, and you're going to get species like bass in Shimon Lake. So again, you can tell what kind of system it is by what lives in it. And those are things that we call bioindicators. And Paul is going to teach us some more about bioindicators now. Thanks, Meredith. And you're right. Living things can tell us more about water quality and how our watershed is doing. They're called bioindicators. Bio, meaning biologically they're living, and indicators, meaning that they indicate something about watershed health. I'll give you an example. Brook trout are a really good bio indicator. They live in Peterborough and the surrounding area and they can tell us a few things about water quality. They need cold water to live. So one, they tell us that there's cold water there. Two, they need a lot of oxygen to survive. So two, it tells us there's a lot of dissolved oxygen in the, in the water that they're living in. And three, that there's probably not a lot of pollution because a lot of pollutants strip the oxygen away. So if there's pollution there, there wouldn't be the high dissolved oxygen. You wouldn't find your brook trout. So brook trout indicate that there's cold, high oxygenated water without a lot of pollution. So they're really neat. However, they also present a challenge. How do you tell if there's brook trout in a stream? They're hard to see, they're hard to catch, and they're really fast. Don't worry, there are easier bioindicators indicators to use for surface water quality indicators. For example, benthic invertebrates. Benthic invertebrates, benthic meaning bottom, invertebrates meaning lacking a vertebrae. We're talking about water bugs, bugs that live at the bottom of the water, usually under rocks. Let me give you a few examples of what benthic invertebrates are and how we can use them as a bioindicator. So one example is a caddisfly. Caddisflies are really neat. They actually build their own cases to help them stay on the bottom, stay camouflaged, and stay out of harm's way of other predators. And the caddisfly is pollution sensitive, meaning that if we find a whole bunch of caddisflies, that that water is probably high water quality. So that's a good thing. Another example would be black flies. Now this is a little baby black fly nymph. That's right. Those black flies that bite you when you're camping, especially in the spring, they start off as benthic invertebrates, aquatic bugs that live at the bottom of our streams. And these little tiny baby black flies are very tolerant to pollution, meaning that they can live in polluted waters. So if you find a whole bunch of black fly larvae and none of our super sensitive caddisfly larvae, it might mean that you've got some pollutant in that water. So they can be used as a bioindicator. Another example, and one of my personal favorites, is the Megaloptera, otherwise known as the Helgramite or Dobson fly. They can grow fairly large and they're a predator um, eating other inverts and small fish um, at the bottom of our uh, streams and, uh, and rivers. Here's a real life example of a, per a preserved Helgramite. And if uh, this is too small for you to see, I have a three foot stuffed replica of a Helgramite here. They have gills underneath all their segments. They got big pinchers that they use to, uh, to hunt and find other benthic invertebrates underneath the rocks. 
a really cool invert. So now that you know that invertebrates can be used as a bioindicator, that they're super awesome, and you can find them underneath rocks in the streams. How do we collect them? Well, there's a couple ways. Check out this uh, quick uh, clip. In this video, you'll see me using a net. This is a simple net. Um, nets with larger holes, you're only gonna catch larger inverts. Nets with smaller holes, you're gonna get a larger variety of inverts. What I'm doing here is I'm kicking really hard using my heel kicking rocks and sand and dirt at the bottom of the uh, of the creek. And what I'm trying to do is suspend all the benthic invertebrates, all those water bugs that are hiding underneath those rocks, up into the water column. And then I'm taking my net and I'm catching all those inverts as they're flowing downstream. So when I'm done this exercise, I have a net, hopefully, full of creepy crawling critters that I can observe more in detail. If you don't have a net, don't worry. Take a look at this clip. You can simply pick up and flip rocks. So you'll see here that I'm just simply taking up a rock, flipping it over, and looking for movement. Often when you flip rocks from streams, you'll find critters moving around. And you can find a variety of benthic invertebrates this way. Really quick, really easy. Now that we know that benthic invertebrates can be used as bioindicators and that they're super awesome and we know how to collect them. How do we observe them? Well, there's some simple tools that you might find at your home or in your kitchen. Ice cube trays. And you can simply sort out all the different uh, benthic invertebrates that you found with a little bit of water to take a little bit of a closer look at. You can use a spoon, plastic preserved, uh, preferred, so you don't... Uh, um, hurt your uh, benthic invertebrates that you caught, and you can use them to help sort your benthic invertebrates. Another nice thing to have is a nice tub or bowl uh, to help you uh, sort your inverts. So now we've got our inverts sorted, and we say we find something really cool that we want to uh, document. There's ways you can do that. You can log into a citizen science website like uh, iNaturalist. So I'm going to log in the iNaturalist here and I'll show you an example of a benthic invertebrate that I got excited about and uh, I logged into iNaturalist so anyone, including yourself, can take a look at it on the internet. So here's this one. This is a stonefly. This is the largest stonefly I've ever seen. I was so excited when I got this. I found it underneath a rock, took a picture and put it on iNaturalist and the stoneflies are really sensitive to pollution, so it means where I caught this um, stonefly probably had good water quality. Now I'm going to send you off to Meredith where she's going to speak more to uh, citizen science and how you can get more involved with uh, data collection and documentation. Well now you've learned how to monitor water quality, you've learned about bioindicators, you've learned about the equipment that we use at Autonomy Conservation for our monitoring programs, and you've learned how to monitor water quality at home or in your classroom, looking at pH and temperature. So you're well on your way to becoming citizen scientists. We hope that you are interested in continuing being citizen scientists, and there are many different programs that you can get involved in. Bird Studies Canada offers the Marsh Monitoring Program, so you can go listen for bird calls and amphibian calls, so frogs and toads, at night. You record all that information, and Bird Studies Canada uses that to help track the health of wetlands across Canada. In Ontario, there's the Lake Partner Program, so you can sign up to go take samples every month of water quality, and then you send that into the province, and they use that to assess the health of the lakes across the province. You can also get involved in the nature watch programs. So those involve looking at ice. So when the ice comes on and off, tracking that time, uh, or when certain plants bloom in the spring and tracking, because over time, those change every year. So you can start to see patterns and also can help us understand the impacts of climate change. You can also be a citizen scientist by simply being aware of your surroundings. If you go for a walk in the same place every day and you see something different, that's being a citizen scientist. You can take a photograph of the same place every year and look for changes over time. It's all about 
being observant, asking questions, and then trying to understand changes if you see any. Sometimes just getting out in nature, using those tools that Paul showed you, the iNaturalist and the eBird, that's a great way to be a citizen scientist. Autonomy Conservation owns 10,000 acres of land, and these include Warsaw Caves, uh, Selwyn Beach, the Harold Town Conservation Area, the Jackson Creek Trail. So you've probably been to many of those properties already. Those properties give you great opportunities to go learn about nature, to practice your citizen science skills. So we encourage you to get outdoors, enjoy nature, and we're so happy to have you along as citizen scientists in our watershed. Thank you.